we are going to talk about gardening tonight. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, first of all, I'm Kay Denniston from the Bourbon County Extension Office. And I drew the short straw and got the first lesson of the year. So I would, thought I was going to be lucky and getting this right when people could do some <laughs> fall gardening and everything. Little did I know I was going to be the guinea pig. But it's a new year. It's oh. a new way. Um, we, can, we can talk about it all night long and still some of us agree and disagree the good or the bad that's coming out of all of this. Um, the biggest thing is we as FCS agents in your county, we, we want to help you. We want to help you through this. We want to help you with your other every, like we've always done. We want to be there. And we welcome any kind of feedback you can give us um, about any other ideas of methods of presentation with all of this. But at the point in time now where we can only or we're very restricted for our safety and for yours. Uh, this is the best we can come, or I could come up with at this time. But please do not hesitate me to email me or your local agent and let them know your needs and what we can do to help you through this. Uh, we'll do what we can. There's no promises. I, don't, I can't send you a check. That's not one of my options. I'll tell you right now, you can save your time. But, um, I do worry about my people and I, I am a people person, so I enjoy seeing people. So the interesting thing about this lesson, I think, is you reap what you sow gardening options. It was voted on by you all as homemakers as a, as a lesson for this year, long before the pandemic. And I find that really interesting because I think we as a society have gotten so spoiled, or at least I know Kay has, of I need something, I run to the grocery, I pick it, buy it, pick it up, bring it home, use it. And at the beginning of this pandemic, what happened was I needed it, I went to the grocery, the shelves were bare. Uh, sometimes I could get it, sometimes I couldn't. I had to learn to adjust, adapt, and then I'm thinking, oh my gracious, what happened to the good old fashioned gardening that I used to do? So um, it's interesting that this topic came about before we knew we were doing the pandemic. So first thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is a, the Victory Gardens. You might have read some about this in some of your newsletters, or you may have heard something uh, uh, for, on the newspapers or podcasts or anything about the, basically Victory Gardens were very popular in the, nine, in the United States during World War I and World War II. Um, but now, our Ag Commissioner, Ryan Quarles, he, he announced that the, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture was going to team up or partner up with the University of Kentucky's Cooperative Extension Service and the Kentucky's Nutritional Education Program to get in touch with our agricultural roots during this pandemic and get back to the Victory Gardens. So, what was the purpose of the Victory Garden? Well, they were also called War Gardens. And what happened, these gardens were raised during a time of crisis. Like I said, World War I and World War II primarily. And the Victory Gardens, along with the um, rationing and the stamps that were given out, kept our country from suffering a food crisis during those times. So the whole concept of reviving the Victory Garden was to save us from a food crisis. And the original Victory Gardens, what they did, they raised garden plants anywhere they could find soil. If there was a piece of soil, they stuck a plant in it. They had soil in, I mean, they had gardens in parking lot medians. They had um, plants planted and on playgrounds, if there was soil there, they had them in window boxes, any place, down fence rows, if there was soil there, they would plant a plant. And then they would harvest the produce from that plant. And it was kind of, basically, if it was outside of your property, it was kind of like a community property. Anytime the beans came on, you better be the first one to get there or you miss them. 
But in doing this, everything that was grown commercially could be used for our men, our soldiers, our men and women that were serving the country. They used up most of our commercial food to feed them. Um, Commissioner Quarles is hoping that is hoping that bringing back the Victory Garden will boost morale. It'll make you feel better mentally, physically, actually working in that garden, garden working in that soil. I am going to stop right here and tell you I am a country girl and I've had to correct my, my notes. I've had to correct my slides because I call it dirt. <laughs> but when you're gardening, you're supposed to call it soil or so my horticulture agent tells me. So if I accidentally say dirt, I think you know what I'm talking about, okay? I'll just get that out in the open right now. Um, Please note that this Victory Garden poster that's on the slide, can everybody see the slides? I forgot to ask. Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. The yes. back of the slide, you can call, if you did not get this ahead of time from your extension office, the extension office has these posters. And on the back, it talks about the benefits of gardening. It talks about recommendations for a family of four. If you had 150, square feet, a family of two, how you can go about it, but some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But I just wanted you to see the poster and get a little bit of background. If you heard anything about Victory Gardens and the Extension Office, you know what they were talking about. So, Mary, Mary, quite, do we have any Marys on here? No Marys? Well, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? Well, we've got all kinds of options. And these options are based on the amount of space you have. Uh, you have the good old traditional garden that you see on the far left of the slide that is in a ground plot. Traditional gardening when rows of plants is what I grew up with as a garden. I don't know about many of you all, but that's what I grew Now, I will honestly say our garden had a few more weeds in between those rows than what Miss Lakes does. This is Janet Lakes' garden. She put that picture on Facebook and I asked her if I could share it. Uh, she's a homemaker here at the Bourbon County Extension Homemakers. So uh, that's your traditional plot. It's in the ground. Um, my grandparents even, the thing I remember most about the traditional gardening was if you had a row of plants, they did what's called um, intercropping. And they might plant pole beans there with a, with a post and string for the pole beans to climb up. But down toward the ground, they would plant squash right beside of it. So they could have one row, but two different plants. So they did some intercropping, and a lot of people did during those times. Uh, the plants in the, I mean, the beds in the middle are what we call raised beds. Um, the one in the, to the left on the raised bed, just we call it a container or a raised bed. This is one that one of our employees, husbands, made this. Oh my goodness. And it has uh, buckets. Okay, it has, it has containers and she has tomato plants up here in the top, uh, pepper plants at the bottom, but wouldn't that be easy to, to go out and harvest and pull things off of and not have to get down on your knees or bend over and pick beans or whatever? Uh, I thought that was very interesting. And then the one at the bottom is one that we're trying to use with some of our apartments here in Bourbon County. It's a feed trough. I don't know if you can see that or not. We're just starting ours. That's actually from a Jessamine County project that they use, but they, they had an apartment complex. And they were trying to teach the people in the apartment complex the value of gardening and how to go about gardening. And they did not have any soil or dirt or that was communal property. So they just had a feed trough donated and they filled it with soil. And uh, I believe they were raising uh, lettuce there. And then on the far side, you've got your container gardens. Now this little picture I used here, this little container garden is a little bit too full probably, but it gives you a good idea of you, if you don't have land that you can till up or, or maybe where you live has restrictions on having gardens, but you have large pots or plants, I mean uh, pots or flower pots or anything like that, even the window boxes I was telling you about. 
um, then you can write, you can have gardening in those things as well. Uh, I will tell you the terracotta pots, if you know what I'm talking about, are awesome. They're, they're hard to get a hold of any, right now. A lot of people are into gardening, but the terracotta pots, you soak those sometimes up to two days before you plant in them and they retain moisture. And also if they're sitting out in the rain and the terracotta gets wet, it will retain the moisture in the dirt. Okay. Now we're ready to start gardening. We're going to select us a site. The first thing I cannot say enough about is once you've decided which kind of you want, whether you want the traditional or the raised bed or the, the flower pot or the container ones, make it convenient for you. A garden is a commitment. A garden is a commitment. It is work. It doesn't just jump into your uh, kitchen. It does not just grow without some, some tender loving care. Um, the first thing I think of in this bullet of make a garden um, convenient for you is when I was younger living at home, my family had a garden. And one year we decided we wanted to increase the size of the garden quite a bit but we didn't have land close by. So uh, we had another piece of property where you had to get in the car and go to it. And, well, we didn't go every day because it was not convenient. And you really, if all possible, you need to be in a garden every, a couple times a week, at least at a minimum. Every day would be even better because that way you're gonna stay on top of problems or issues that you need to address, or even when it comes harvest time, you, that way you don't lose some of your product. But needless to say that year that we had that huge garden, we lost probably more money on plants and seeds and things because we it was inconvenient to drive over there and take care of it. So you make it convenient for you because you're the one that's gonna have to take care of it as far as the site. Now, the next thing is you need, uh, at least six to eight hours of sunlight every day. That is, that's what plants grow on. Nutrients from the soil, water from the sky, and the sun from the sky. And all plants need six, anywhere from six to eight hours of sunlight. And when you're picking this spot, look for spots where other things are growing well. Don't look at a bare spot in a yard and say, oh my gracious, nothing's growing there. That's a good place to put a garden because I won't have any weeds. Not, okay? If weeds won't grow there, then your garden's probably not gonna grow there either. So be real cautious about where you're putting your, your location of your garden. Uh, if there's no, nothing growing there, that shows that there's a lack of uh, organic content and nutrients in that soil. Soil drainage is very important. Um, you don't want water standing. You don't want, if you want to test the, uh, the best way to test the soil to see if it's, um, if it drains well is dig a hole in the, the site that you're considering. Dig a hole that's about one foot wide and one foot deep. Fill it up with water. If that water disappears in one to two days, then that soil probably drains well. If it does not drain well, then you're gonna have problems with root, root, rot, root rot and you're gonna have a lot of disease. Oh, I forgot problems. to move it, didn't I? So. I just roll it up and put it in that ashtray, one of the mice trays. Um, A, can you, re can you remind people about Turning off their oh, uh, yes. yeah, audio. Please, if you can mute your, your audio, it, it's, it's less distractive. Um, I'm trying to see if there's, uh, if I could get to the chat room, which I can't. Shonda, are you still there? If you can yes, get to the I, chat, chat room, I think there's a place where you can mute everyone. I will try to figure it out. I think it's in the chat room at the bottom. I'm going to go on, okay? I was going to say, because I'm not the host, I don't know that I can. Oh, I thought everybody could. Okay. 
my problem, my problem. If everybody could kind of take care of that, that would be good because it is distracting. Also, plant away from trees. Trees are going to steal. Your trees are going to steal the nutrients from your plants. The other thing we don't realize is when you look at a tree, the roots extend three to four times farther than the tree shades. If you look at, you stand at the base of a tree and look straight up and you can see how far that tree sh it covers the canopy of the tree. Just think that the, the roots of that tree go three to four times farther. So you're going to need to stay away from those roots because the roots are going to create problems for uh, nutrients as well as when you get ready to dig the dirt, you're going to find some problems. Also, black walnut trees. Uh, I don't have that on there, but black walnut trees, which we do have some in Kentucky, you want to stay away from those because they have a substance or give off a substance in their leaves and their roots. It, it's J-U-G-L-O-N-E. I'll butcher it in pronouncing it probably. I think it's juglon, but it, uh, it interferes with the growth of most of our, your veggies and it can create disease with your veggies. Another thing about trees is they track all these little critters like raccoons. Okay, you don't want to have raccoons in your corn because they find it without the tree, okay? Um, trees are just, trees also do, will steal the sunshine. Um, if you're going to have trees or buildings, they should be on the north side of your garden. If they are on the southeast or west, they will steal the sunshine. If we're on the north side, they don't tend to shade as much in our, our part of the United States. But, uh, and they also prevent a little bit of wind from getting to your garden. Any questions over on selecting our sites? Okay, we're ready to plan. If you've not gardened before, I strongly suggest you start out small because you've heard me say once or twice, and you'll probably hear me say at least five more times, a garden is a commitment, okay? I love them, I love fresh produce, I enjoy watching things grow, I love uh, preserving them and, and having veggies in the winter from a garden, but they are work, and their work schedule does not necessarily evolve around your work schedule. In other words, they don't wait to ripen when you are available to do freezing and canning. They ripen according to Mother Nature's plan, not yours. Also select plants that your family will eat, that you're actually gonna use. Um, if, if you know that nobody in your family likes peppers, then don't plant peppers just because your neighbors are or because the guy at the end of the street was selling plants when you were wanting to do a, a garden. Uh, select crops. Be you want to make yourself successful. Don't set yourself up for failure. And um, the, if you don't like peppers, I'll almost guarantee you you'll have a bumper crop of peppers because it always seemed like whatever we liked the least is what we had the most of. So be careful about what you're choosing to plant it, plant in your garden. Um, be with be familiar with the characteristics about your. Um, plants that you're choosing. Um, by that, what I mean is how long does it take for that plant to mature? How long, when can I expect to harvest uh, uh, vegetables from that plant? When should I put this on? And that's why I have a calendar over here on the side. Um, I had a picture, I had one that showed you the front of it too. The uh, extension office may still have some of these. Uh, these uh, growing your own garden. They're great calendars for gardening because they are slick and you can write on them. And it's kind of like journaling and gardening because if you put a garden out in May and let's say you decided to put out, um, let's say you put out five tomato plants. And then in July and August, especially August when tomatoes are coming on, you realize you didn't plant enough tomato plants. You need more for your family. 
So you go back to August. You, what you would do is when you planted in May, you would write down how many plants you, you, you purchased. And then when August, when you realize that wasn't enough, you can go back to May so that you have your May calendar next year and say you want to increase it to 10 or you want to increase it to 15, whatever fits, fits yours. These, and they also have tips in them. These are great little calendars. Um, if you can call your extension office and see if you, and I might have a couple left. I don't know if you, if you can't get them, let me know. But it also tells you on there, you can't read it, but it tells you what you should be doing in uh, week one in August in our, in our growing zone. And I'll read it to you. In week one, you should begin to seed transplants and trays for your fall gardening. Week two, check on your sweet corn and see if it's ready to harvest. So it tells you when to anticipate these things. Um, it's, it's a real handy little tool and it, it's, like I said, because you can wipe it off, you can write in it with a uh, dry erase pen and then wipe it off for next year and, and have it ready to go. When you are picking plants, oh, there you go, Shonda, thank you. When you're picking plants for your garden, consider plants that might attract pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, pollination with especially our bees is getting to be quite a problem in our, in our world right now. Um, so if you wanna plant things that will attract that, that might be helpful too. Also be mindful about what you're gonna do with your garden. Okay, do you want it to, do you want to have things to preserve in the, in the, for the winter? Or do you just want to have it to enjoy the summer? That will affect how you plan your garden. Um, rotation, rotation is extremely important. That's what I was looking for. It's right up there on the bullet. A rotation to reduce pest problems and increase uh, fertility of the soil. What I mean by that, especially if people like to have tomato plants. Even if you don't have a garden, I've noticed a lot of people have tomato plants. They'll put out two or three tomato plants. You should not plant tomatoes or peppers in the same location for more than three years. In three years time, that spot of soil will be drained of all the nutrients that it takes to produce quality tomatoes and peppers. So what you do is you put tomatoes and peppers there and you, it really did well and you wanna put it back there next year, that's okay. But after that third year, you need to put some green beans and corn in there or something that's going to up the fertility. And after you have it with green beans and corn for about three years, then you can go back to tomatoes because that corn and green beans, which are perfect examples, a lot of this is chemistry that I won't get into, but green beans and corn is a great replacement for um, soil that has been raising tomato plants. I always encourage people to grow one thing, not a lot of it because you're not sure, but grow, be adventuresome or experiment. Grow one thing that you may have never had just to see how you like it. Um, I always think of the example of green beans, maybe, Maybe you do like green beans, maybe you don't like green beans, but try a different variety of green beans. I don't know how many of you have ever tried dragon tongue green beans. They're not green, number one. Um, they are, they have the same, they look like the green bean, but they're just not green and they're kind of a purple and yellow. They are delicious, especially mixed in with another bean. But the thing I like about them is if you've got children that will not eat green and they don't like to eat vegetables, but they're into dragons and things like that, you can say, hey, let's try these dragon tongues. And um, that worked with my nephew. And I'll always remember that because he'd never had dragon tongue until he came to my house. So. Uh, Dragon Tongue's a good, a good idea of being adventurous and trying something different that you can enjoy. Um, working the soil. Good soil is the backbone of a healthy garden. I will repeat. Good soil is the backbone of a healthy garden. 
I can't repeat that enough. That's probably the biggest thing here. If you, the soil's not good, the soil's what supplies the plant with the nutrients and if the plant soil doesn't have the nutrients, then you're gonna struggle with raising any type of produce there. Good soil produces good produce. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna work that soil. It's easiest to work the soil in the spring. If you're doing the traditional gardening, you're probably gonna want somebody to plow your little plot or use a rototiller. You can work the soil with a um, shovel. You need to go down one to two feet and turn that dirt. Down one to two feet and turn that dirt. If you're doing very much with that shovel, you're gonna get tired real fast. So I highly recommend in traditionals, you could do that in a raised bed pretty easy. You could probably even do it with a trowel, which, and mixing the dirt. And at the end here, I'm gonna show you how I mix some dirt, I hope. But anyway, <laughs> um, if, and when you're wanting to work in the garden, you don't wanna work when it's wet. If you look at the picture there to the side, a test for moisture, if you're thinking about planting or you're thinking about working uh, the soil, if you go down and just pick, go out in the garden area and pick up a big clump of the, the soil and squeeze it in your hand, if it clumps up, then it's, it's too moist. If it doesn't clump up, if it's kind of loose but not powdery, like the one on the right, then that's a good, that's a good time to work your soil. Um, also, you need to remove large sticks and rocks because I have found that plants do not grow well on sticks or rocks. So you wanna get those out of there to make more room for the, for the dirt and make it. You, also, you might wanna consider adding some organic matter because it will give nutrients, um, loosens the heavy soil, allows for sandy. But what are these organic matters? There's three types. There's plants, which is leaves, straw, glass, grass clippings, okay? They've all, all three of those come from a plant. If you're gonna use grass clippings to add to your soil to increase the organic matter, you need to do that several months before you're ready to plant because you wanna give it time to break down or start to deteriorate. You're, you're wanting that to start to work into the, dirt, the soil. Uh, you can use animal, animal manure, cow manure, chicken manure, rabbit manure. You put an inch of that on top. This is ideally, you'd put about an inch of, on top of your soil and then mix it in with the rototiller or mix it in with a shovel. Compost is decayed plant matter. That's like uh, decayed uh, potato peels or potato food, uh, decayed food matter. Uh, and you do it the same way as you do the manure. You do one inch layer, work it into the soil. Some of you might have co compost uh, in your homes. How do we know whether to do this or not? I highly recommend in testing your soil. Uh, if you do a test on your soil, you will know what it's lacking in. And you're gonna do this soil test after the soil is worked. In other words, after you've plowed it up or tilled it or loosened it. And then I would call your extension office for guidance on your testing. Um, it's available for free in a lot of your counties. If it's not free in your county, the most it's gonna cost you is six to $7. And that way, what happens is you take that dirt, you take a sample of it, there's a certain amount you need. Um, we need to mute again, I think. Everybody make sure they check our mutes. is muted. Because this part's kind of important. It's a service that's available to you that I'd like for you to know about. I think uh, it's a few people that might be on their the phone, not necessarily on a computer. Oh, okay. Um, so everybody kind of just make sure, or if you can't mute, try to make sure the background noise is a little bit less. I can fix this. Hold on just a second. It won't take <laughs> any long, I promise. Kay, Kay I has promise. the power. She does have the power. Well, I thought because I made you, um. Am I co-host? Yeah. 
No, I can't find Kids it. Kids got more power than I do. I think you got almost. There we go. I think we'll see. We'll find out. Sorry for that. Okay, this soil test. Next slide. Okay, there we go. This soil test, um, you collect soil, you have to have a certain amount. When they have little bags at the extension office, you put the soil in, you bring it in, we send it to UK. You do need to remember that all this testing is being done at UK for the entire state. So it's gonna take approximately two weeks to get your results back. So don't wait till the day before you want to put the plants in the ground to get your soil tested. You actually should do this probably right after you work your ground in March. Uh, and after that test is tested at UK, they run tests on it to see what the soil's lacking in. There were, thank you, Shonda's got a bag. Oh, you're such a great assistant, Vanna White. And then your agent will write recommendations for you. And actually the next slide is about fertilizing. And I am going to steer rather, I'm just gonna tread on this very lightly because it's going to be different for every single one of you probably. I can't tell you exactly what fertilizer to put on your garden because I have not tested your soil. I can tell you that it may need be, may not be needed if you use the compost that we talked about, but it might, and you're not going to know unless you test it. I can also tell you that the numbers on the bag are in order of the amount of nitrogen. The second number is phosphorus, and the third number is potassium. It's listed in that order on almost all, your, all of the fertilizer bags. It's supposed to be that way. Now, I know better than to make guarantees, but um, they're listed in that order. So when your agent, when your horticulture or your ag agent see, says that you need more phosphorus, then you look for one high number in phosphorus. I can also tell you to need to wash your hands after handling fertilizer. There are chemicals in there that are dangerous. They can cause damage to your eyes. They, they're just, make sure you wash your hands even if you use give ups. So I will address questions on fertilizing if you want. It's just gonna be very individual, uh, which makes it hard to address in a, in a PowerPoint. It's more a hey, can I yes. can I tell a little story? Sure. So um, my dad, uh, before I even worked at the extension office, he had uh, utilized, had tried to utilize the soil sampling um, up here. But before he did that, the reason he needed to is because he felt like people say add organic material, add things, and he was adding, um, I guess, the ashes from oh. from, um, from after your um, fireplace. You know, mm -hmm. you take your soot and all of those things, and it's supposed Spring to be good. Valley's chimney, which is great, but apparently is pretty high in I think nitrogen. Nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and so he couldn't understand, and so it's one of those things. It's really important to kind of check with people who probably who may know a little bit more than you, like our ag agents or hort agents who'd be able to do that because he thought he was doing a great thing, but he had done too much and it took a while to get those levels back to get together. So that's uh, a great point because it's a whole lot easier to put that in the ground than it is to take it out. Yes. That is really, that's a great point that should, I'm glad you brought that up because if check with someone that have the test run, like I said, it's either free or six to $7, call your office. Um, it depends on the county. And, but be patient, two weeks, okay? <laughs> so now we're ready to plant something. We're gonna put something in this ground uh, so we can eat something. We're finally ready to do that. There's two types of seeding. You've got a direct seeding when, and this one, if, if you cook, it's the same thing. You, re, you read a recipe when you cook, or a lot of people do. I mean, my grandmother didn't, so some people may not, but direct seeding, read your packet, read your packet, read your packet. Um, on the back of your packet, it will tell you how far apart, how deep to put the seeds. Go by the directions on the packet. I thought I had a packet here. Uh, I, I took it to the other room so we can plant it in a minute. I'm sorry. Um, but it's basically putting seed in dirt. Transplanting is a little bit different. 
transplanting is the best results for, there you go. Shonda's got our seed packet up there. It's either upside down or backwards, but it's there. Okay, the directions are, the directions are on the back. Transplanting, you take a plant that was started indoors. Uh, usually those are the plants that cannot handle frost, can't handle the cold weather. And uh, like it says on the slide, it uh, will speed things up. Transplanting, if you're moving a plant from, uh, from a greenhouse or from, uh, even if you buy them at Lowe's or wherever, I don't know, I shouldn't promote anyone tractor supplying, I, the list goes on and on. If you're gonna put it in the ground, you need to do it the best time, you'll get the best results if you do it early morning, cloudy day, or late day. Now let's think, what do those three things have in common? It's the coolest part of the day. Early morning, cloudy day, it's not quite as hot, and late day. It's because you, first of all, you want that, and I left that out, so sorry, let me back up a little bit. The transplant, when you get ready to move that plant from the little plug that you bought or raised in your greenhouse, and you're gonna go put it in the soil, it needs to be have been watered. Not right then, but right before then. It shouldn't be moist. It shouldn't be soggy but it should be moist. And you want that plant to have that moisture to live on for a while. And if you plant it in the heat of the day or on a windy day, it will dry it out. So you're, the reason you're planting early morning, late day, cloudy day, is to maintain or keep the moisture in the roots of that plant as long as possible. Um, a good transplant will have roots that are well developed and growing tightly in the plot. Um, and like I'm looking at my notes now, it says before transplanting, make sure plants have been watered recently, not necessarily right as you're putting it in the ground, but recently. They shouldn't be soaking wet, but they should be moist. Um, to transplant, pardon? I was gonna, I was just gonna add, but I'll let you finish first. Oh, okay. To transplant, you just make a hole. The size of the hole will depend on the size of the plant. Uh, you want the entire root to fit comfortably in the side of the hole. You don't want it too deep. You want it to be about uh, ground level or a little bit below. And then once you put the, dig the hole, you place the plant in it like they're doing in the picture. Then you scoop the dirt up back up around the plant. Um, the soil is put back in the hole and the plant should stand straight up on its own after you fill the hole up and the roots should be covered. If the roots are not covered, back up and repeat because you're wasting your time. If those roots are exposed to all the sun and everything that's going to come along, animals and everything else, then it's probably not going to survive. So, and then after you've push the soil up around the plant and stand in there just really cute little plant that you're gonna watch grow. Uh, don't pack it down real tight. It should be firm, but don't, a lot of people I see step on plants. Well, then that typically breaks the stem off. Okay, Shonda, did you have something else on that? Or? I was just gonna say that um, if you do grow them from seed inside, like in a greenhouse or something like that, or if you're doing it inside, um, just give them a little bit of time to acclimate when you take them. Um, so like if you buy them from Lowe's and Rural King and that kind of stuff, a lot of times they're already outside. So those might not need to be, but if you feel super adventurous and want to start it from a seed, um, but they're inside your house, go ahead and put them outside for a little bit during that cool part of the day and get them used to being outside in their new home. Thank you. Okay, everybody, after I've told you that so many times to mute, <laughs> we're gonna unmute because I need some I, so I need some feedback from you you can either put it in the chat room if you're if you're shy and don't want to talk or if you are um, just you can shout it out I'm okay because we're gonna do some interacting of plant spacing and some of your gardeners and may already know this but if not let's just yes okay because it's time you know Zooms get long and boring after a while. So let's do some matching. How far apart 
If you're planting cucumbers in your garden, how far apart do you think you should space your uh, cucumbers to get the best growth and, pro and production? I wouldn't plant them because I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Susan. <laughs> okay, somebody that likes cucumbers, guess. No. Three Three inches. Inches. What? Three inches. Well, Somebody said 12, somebody said three. Oops. Oh, no. It's probably 18. One inch. That's actually what I do. No, it's not <laughs> one inch. No, no, no. There's, it's supposed to be little lines that come up and go over and give you the answers, but it didn't happen. So I will give you the answers. It's 12 to 16 inches. And see, there's supposed to be a little line that when I click. Okay, the line. The lines are on our, uh, if, if you have a printed copy, the lines are on there. Oh. That's how I knew. <laughs> oh, she's, she's cheated. cheated. She's cheating. I love it. I love it, Sue. I love it. Okay. She used her resources. Yes. Well, let me tell you something. I got so excited. My secretary did that. I don't know how to do it. And she did this, and I probably screwed it up because I was practicing a while ago, and it's probably a one-time deal. But uh, I thought, I feel so special because I can just click, and that little line will go straight down to that 12 to 16 inches. Okay, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. So, so you, can't, you can't play anymore. <laughs> Look, she's, she's letting everybody else do it. Oh, she's trying to help everybody else. I'm sorry. How if far apart should we put those cabbage plants? If you 18 go to the inches. 12 to 24 inches. Yeah. 12 That's 20, 18. 18. And they need a little more space. And how many times have you planted a, like a lilac bush at your house or something like that? And you think, oh, it's all the way out in the, in the yard. And then after it grows a few years, it's up in the window and you didn't put it far enough away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Same thing. Same thing happens with vegetables. They need their space to acclimate. Uh, they need their space to produce. Okay. Now this one, if you have ever, well, if you've ever been a tobacco farmer, you probably know this one. Tomatoes, how far it's apart? 12 to 24. Yeah. 18. 18 inches, 12 to 24 is in there. But you know why I knew that? Because we used to set our tomato plants with a tobacco sitter. And a tobacco sitter, you put that plant in there every click, okay? With tomato plants, we had to put it every other click, which was 18 inches. Too much information, I know. Broccoli, how far are we gonna put the broccoli plants? 12. No. Nope. 15, 15, yay. Carrots. Three. Three. I was going to say, I'm going to give you a hint. It's straight across from it. Okay. One. Three inches. Oh, three. Eggplant. Oh, that's big. 12, 12 inches. 12 inches, yes. Beets. This used to be my job. I used to get to plant the beets. Two to three. Two to three inches. Um, lettuce. Four. Four inches. And radishes. One. Inch. One inch. <laughs> Have any of you ever um, used radishes instead of potatoes in your roast carrots and potatoes? Like if you do a roast carrots and potatoes, do roast carrots and radishes? Experiment with it some. If you ever want to do low carbs, or if you're watching carbs do, or sugar, or whatever with diabetes, radish is a good substitute. And when you, it, when you get finished cooking them, they don't look anything like a radish. They look more like a potato. Now, they don't taste like a potato, but that's just a little bit extra info. <laughs> oh, I wanted to tell you too, before I go on, and it's not on that part, cool season um, plants versus warm season plants. Cool season crops are things that, that will take a little bit of frost, okay? They don't freeze out. Uh, a hard freeze will get them, but a little bit of frost won't. And these are things that we usually plant in the early spring or the fall coming up. And uh, 
things like cabbage and broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, radishes, snow peas, turnips, lettuce. I'll usually put lettuce out with uh, in the spring, early, early spring. And then your warm, sum, your warm season or summer crops do not tolerate any frost. A lot of people got real excited about gardening this year and put those tomato plants out way too early. And what happened, they ended up planting tomato plants again. So people that were selling tomato plants really had a bumper season this year because they got to sell them to you twice. Um, tomatoes will not tolerate frost as will beans, cucumbers, corn, pepper, none of those will not tolerate. You should rule of thumb, do not plant a garden with warm season crops until after Mother's Day, on Mother's Day or after. Now, some of you are gonna say, I've always been told Derby Day. I have been too, I've always, I've heard Derby Day, I've heard Mother's Day. This past year, I don't know if y'all remember this or not, but if, if we didn't have a Derby, <laughs> but if you've done it on what is our typical Derby Day, we had a frost after that. Now, it wasn't a freeze, it was a frost. So uh, I, from here on, I'll go with Mother's Day. And I'm, I'm sure some point in time that might be too early too, but it's just a, easier for me to remember than a date in May. If you're watering, all plants need water to grow, okay? And they need an inch of water a week. Now, if it's out in the soil and the dirt, and you're not sure whether it's got enough water or not, you go down from the, the bottom of the plant, go out two inches and down two inches, you feel, and if it's got enough moisture, you're fine. I will tell you, this is why Kay Denniston is not a very good container gardener. And if you all are, I respect it and think that's wonderful. I think container gardening is wonderful because I live in a subdivision where gardens are frowned upon. Uh, tried it a little bit again this year. Container gardens have to be watered every day. Now, the books will tell you and the handout that I sent to you says one, every one to two days. But if you don't, that, that water just, that dirt does not, that, excuse me, that soil does not retain the moisture that you're putting in it. So you've got to use more water with container gardening. Uh, I will tell you on raised beds, they need just a little bit more but not quite, they, use, they need one and a half inches in a week. So the other thing <clears throat> I'd like to, for you to remember about watering is to, if at all possible, water at the base of the plant, shoot for the base of that plant. Now you do not have to take a uh, glass of water and go out and uh, water each individual plant like this picture is. <laughs> I think that's a little unrealistic, but um, the roots are what need the water. The leaves do not need the water. They get their nutrients from their roots. The roots are what need the water. If you put water on the leaves, then it's just increasing the possibility of attracting insects or more than that, a fungus and diseases. Um, but water at the base of that. If you're using a sprinkler, Okay, if we're, we're going for a while without water and you decide you need to hook up the sprinkler, sprinkle early in the day, turn your sprinkler on, leave it a while for early in the day, and then turn it off. That gives that plant all day long to get that water off of the leaf. In other words, all day long that leaf is letting that water drip to the dirt or soil and, um, and drying out a little bit. But um, if you're going to use a sprinkler, it's early in the day is best. The longer a leaf stays wet, the more likely you are to get disease. And then here's my favorite plant, weeds. <clears throat> I'm good at raising weeds. Um, weed steel. It's a competition, people. It is a competition. If you don't work on it, they will win. They steal the nutrients from your plants. Um, they steal the water from your plants and if they get very tall they'll shade out your plants and steal the sunshine from your plants. Um, they also attract disease and insects and if you're going to get weeds, if you're going out to weed a garden, 
don't let those weeds go to seed. The seed just causes them to drop to the ground and produce more weeds. But if you pull a weed up, if you pull a weed up, and I can hear my daddy now talking about two things, about chopping weeds and pulling weeds. If you pull a weed up, you don't just drop it where you pulled it because they can reroot and they also can release seeds into the dirt. So you really, you, you've defeated your whole purpose if you do not throw that plant away out into uh, vegetation or something or gather it up and take it in a bucket or something like that. Hoeing, if you're using a hoe, and if you've got a large garden, you're not gonna pull very many weeds, you're gonna use a hoe. Um, make sure you cut the root of that plant. Don't just chop it off at ground level because the root will reproduce the weeds, okay? So it's not gonna do you much good. The best way of controlling weeds is to not get them in the first place. And how do you do that? By mulching. Uh, especially in your traditional gardens. Mulch will help control weeds. The only thing I caution you on, oh, you can use leaves as mulch, you can use grass clippings as mulch, newspaper as mulch, cardboard. The only thing I caution you about these last two, newspaper and cardboard need to be shredded so that the water can pass through it. Now, newspaper is not as bad about this as cardboard, but if you just take cardboard out there and lay it in between, uh, be careful. I've seen people do it, I've seen people do it successfully, but be real careful or you're gonna have water standing on top of that cardboard um, and, and create, when you have standing water, you get mosquitoes and other insects as well. <clears throat> Need to know which insects are friend and which ones are enemy. We do have some beneficial insects like uh, ladybugs, and then we have some that are pests. We've had, I don't know if you've, many of you had the green worm on your tomatoes this year that blended right in with your tomato plant. It was even, everybody kept bringing things in here to the office saying, something's eating my tomato plant, something's eating my tomato plant. And they'd say, and Ray'd ask them, now, you know, do you see anything on it? No, no, no. And then they bring the plant in and right there's the worm. The worm is the exact same color as the plant and they were eating the tomatoes before they ever even the, the buds started turning to tomatoes. Some flowers help with keeping pests away, and then they also attract the beneficial or the friend insect. Marigolds, my grandmother put marigolds around her every garden she ever had uh, to help keep insects away. Yarrow is good for keeping insects away or the pesty ones. I will tell you, use chemicals as a last resort. Chemicals are very controversial right now. Um, just watch TV and all the ads of people that people are wanting you to sue because you use Roundup. Um, there, chemicals of any kind are typically, if, if you don't read the directions, they're very dangerous. And part of the problem with a lot of these lawsuits not being, um, they're not winning is because the roundup specifically says that you are to wear masks and you are to wear gloves on the directions of the roundup and so we don't typically our society we we see it we, we ask our neighbor what they used on their garden and then we go get it and we spray it and we don't read those directions so you can use chemicals be very very cautious with them i personally i'm not a fan of chemicals um but use them as a last resort. The chemicals are also gonna kill your bees, as well as the, it's gonna kill your, your beneficial insects, as well as your pest. If you're gonna use it, use it only where needed. In other words, you see a weed, you, you spray it. You see a weed, you spray it. You don't just massively spray your whole garden. Uh, please, please, please keep these chemicals away from your children and any children in your neighborhood or visiting children or grandchildren and from your pets. Use masking gloves and wash your hands immediately after using them, even if you use gloves. Please. So we're, going, we've, we're finished with the garden. We've, we've picked the site, we've planted it, we've worked the soil, we've planted it, we've harvested, 
Now we didn't talk much about harvesting or food preservation. That's a whole other lesson in itself, which I would love to be teaching food preservation right now, but it's kind of hard to do it virtually. Uh, but when that garden's finished and it's no longer producing, or you're, you're either it's no longer producing, or you're just tired of fooling with it, I please remember to remove all your plants at the end of the season. Leaving dead plants out in your garden all winter long, those plants have diseases in them. The diseases are just, and the insects are just multiplying. So when you go to raise a crop in that uh, same plot of ground next year, you're gonna have problems. So, and plus it speeds up next year's gardening. The plot's already clean and pretty and ready to turn that soil. Uh, now's a good time if you wanna use fresh manure in your gardens. The fall is the best time to use fresh manure. We don't use fresh manure in the, notice when I said that earlier, I said dry or old. Uh, fresh manure still has a lot of seeds, possibly that are going to cause weeds um, and that have uh, pathogens in them. So we don't use fresh manure on a garden in the spring, but you might wanna use it in the fall. And the reason you can use it in the fall is it has all winter to deteriorate or to work, break down and work into your soil. So our references, this is the copies of the things that you should receive from your agent. If you didn't, please don't hesitate to call them because they will gladly email it to you or make you some copies for them. This is a very good preparing your garden um, handout. I know that's messing with your, the writing. Everything pretty much from this PowerPoint is in here. Uh, tips and tricks for starting a backyard garden is one that's put out by Kentucky State. This one is put up by our uh, a Nutrition NEP uh, UK College of Agriculture. I'll get it out in a minute. College of Agriculture in partnership with our Nutrition Education Program. And this one is put out by uh, K-State, Kentucky State University. And then the photos that I used in the PowerPoint came from those uh, publications. And I wanted to give him, oh, 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 no, no, no. What happened here? I just realized this recording is gonna be so full of so many different things. Uh, I'm back. There we go. There we go, what's next? This publication that you see here, uh, Home Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky, is available at your extension office. I will tell you it's about 50 pages. This is for the serious gardener. And if, if you are one of those, then please, please, we will gladly print this for you. I, I encourage you to call ahead. We don't keep a bunch of these printed up anymore because they are, uh, they're dated and the information in them changes yearly. So uh, be careful about that. But if you would like one, you can call your extension office and get a copy. It has, even if you want to do in some commercial, start thinking about commercial production of garden vegetables. Uh, there's a little bit of that in it. It's based for the home vegetable garden. I will have to tell you, I told you about Janet Lake and her post on Facebook. And I hope, yeah, there we go. This one worked. Uh, this is, I cut and pasted straight from Facebook. This is my post. I, she had that picture of her gardens on there and that was just one of about four. And I posted, Janet, beautiful. Would you teach the gardening lesson with me? That's what we're doing right now. And this was her response and I loved it. I said, can I share this with our uh, people? Her response was, okay, that's so funny. I don't know anything other than you put the seed in the ground, you have good ground, and a great husband. <laughs> so people, if you wanna have a good garden, 
maybe Janet will share her great husband who worked in your great garden, but she, she reinforced that good ground that I was talking about. So questions. Okay. Hey. Uh, yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, in the uh, uh, leaflets and stuff that I got from the extension office, there uh -huh. is evaluation sheet in here. Yes. Is that for my club members or do I fill that out and send it to you or? Okay. What That's perfect lead in. And I didn't pay you to do that, did I? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What it is, is the little packet of seeds that Shonda, oh, there they are right beside of me. These seeds right here. Okay, if you fill out your evaluation, anybody who watches this Zoom, this Zoom is recorded and it's going to be on Bourbon County's YouTube channel. Okay, if you're familiar with using YouTube, <clears throat> it will be recorded and be there. So, anybody that watches this video, or any of you that are watching tonight, if you fill out the evaluation, you will receive a packet of these seeds. This is my thank you for being my guinea pig, okay? And that's what I wanted to share with you. I really, really, really appreciate your patience. I struggle to sit still this long, so I really admire you guys for sitting still this long. And I also hate PowerPoints, by the way. Uh, I use PowerPoints in my presentations, my live presentations, just to keep me on, from going off on tangents and telling stories. I love to tell stories about my family, and I did get a few of those in. But um, to answer your question, if you fill out that evaluation, Sue, is that who asked that question? Yes. What yes. county are you? Remind me, please. Scott County. Scott County. Okay. Scott County has these. Okay, there's a few counties that Madison County, I'm going to try to take yours to you tomorrow or Monday. Let me tell you what happened. I was going to mail all these, but then China up and sent seeds in the mail, and everybody's scared to death to get seeds in the mail now. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I've had to hand deliver them. So uh, Scott County, uh, Ben took his, uh, you're also over there the other day. So if you'll take your evaluation in, uh, all right. Check with one of the agents because you all don't have any staff assistance right now, but you will soon. But somebody there will be able to give you a packet of these seeds if you hand them an evaluation. All right, thank you. Does that makes sense. Okay, yes. I'm going to go plant these seeds in the other room. If you're tired or you don't want to watch or whatever, or if I lose you, because the the goal was to do this on my phone in there. Let's see if that happens. So uh, it'll be quiet for just a minute, okay? I'll be right back. That's all right, I can feel the time. Um, so I'm gonna put a shameless plug in. I'm, I'm in the Clark, I'm Clark County FCS agent, if you all don't know. And I let Kay do this amazing um, guinea pig because I'm next. <laughs> so the leader lesson for next month, um, we will be doing the same type of format and I'm, I'm Kay, Kay has shared all of her tips and we'll probably, you know, have some other great information, but we're doing couponing and budgeting apps next month. So um, keep an eye out for that. And, um, and like I said, it's, it's Kay's done an awesome job and this is a new forum for all of us. So we're really just trying to work it out. So we really appreciate you guys. We're going to do your seeds. I've got a pot here. It has no holes in the bottom. If you get a pot that has no holes in the bottom, remember you've got to have soil that drains well. So we're just gonna use small gravel. This is actually smaller than what I normally want. But I just use more of it. And the whole point of using the gravel is to hold the, the soil up, okay? We put some gravel in the bottom. And then, I gotta show you these before I go any farther. You can use gloves if you want, but has, how many of you have seen these? This is so much fun. Can you see the? You can see them, they're scary. They have points on them. They're to dig in dirt, like when you're planting things or to wear at Halloween, whichever. So, <laughs> but I just thought those were so cool. Um, after that, we're gonna put the soil in.
This isn't going quite as planned, but close, okay? Our soil has big clumps in it. Can you see that? That would be like what we would do when we talked about working the soil. We're breaking those clumps up. You a raised bed or a pot, or if it was a ground, uh, the soil like the garden plot, you probably want to use a shovel to do that. Okay, I'm just gonna check and make sure, and I realize you can't see, but we're gonna fill this up with dirt, soil, excuse me. I need a little thing that's, like dirt's a dirty word. And then on the back of the packet, it says that you're going to plant these seeds about a fourth of an inch deep. See that? That top part is a fourth of an inch. It's not very big. So let's get these. I think it'll probably hold all of this. Yeah, you, know, you took um, Shonda's oil class last year when she taught about the essential oils. This isn't nearly as much fun as that was, Shonda. Sorry. That was fun. Okay, I'm going to rake a little bit over to the sides. We're going to take our seeds. And we're just gonna sprinkle them very lightly, not all in one place. Now, this has, and I have to put my glasses back on to read it. This packet has sweet basil, oregano, chives, parsley in it. It's got a wide assortment. You're gonna to have to, I'm gonna lightly cover this my little seeds, and I mean lightly, because a fourth of an inch isn't very much. Break up my quads, and then just gently, not pour it all in one spot. That's potting soil too, I forgot to tell you that. That's not soil from out back, it's potting soil. And then we'll check on the moisture. How do we check on it? Remember, we stick our finger down in it two inches, see if it's moist each day. If it needs some more water, we'll mop. The reason I did herbs is because you can right grow these inside, you can grow them outside, you can have them wherever. Now, obviously, you can't do them if it's frost outside in cold weather. But if you have them outside, you can bring them in. The one thing that I caution you on, because we did these once before, remember all those things I said are in there? This pot is only big enough for about four plants of herbs. We talked about transplanting. You might want to transplant them into a, other pots. I don't know how much you use herbs. I love fresh herbs. I've got basil in my house right now. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. I just love the smell. <laughs> It makes my kitchen smell so good. I bought it at a farmer's market the other day. It was only 75 cents, and I figured it's worth every bit of 75 cents just to smell it. So, uh, But try this out, and as you know, you can let them grow fairly big, but when you see that they're getting, when, you, when they're big enough for you to identify what's a basil and what's oregano, then you might want to transplant some of them. There's also, and I didn't bring it with, oh, there it is. There is a handout on growing herbs, okay? When you go get your herbs, when you turn your evaluation in to your extension office, they'll give you a packet of herbs and they'll give you this handout that says, learn more about growing herbs in containers. And that's exactly what this is. Voila. Questions? Yes, yeah, where did you get the gloves that has the dig thing, the claws on them? Amazon. Oh, okay. 
Amazon. Okay. Sorry, but I got these back. I started on this lesson. I told you I've changed this lesson five times. And I started on this lesson. We couldn't get anything anywhere. Okay. So I yeah. just started think, looking at uh, possible things new and different and gardening. Uh, and the shipping was a problem with a lot of places. So yes. Amazon, I got these little balls. And, and, oh, I can't mess up my seeds. I was going to, I can do it here. See this? This is something else you might want to consider. We just took plain old garlic out of the grocery store, pulled a clove off, and put it in the in this pot here. And we dug a little spot, and we're it's growing. It's a garlic. Yes. Uh, I don't know what it's gonna be like. It's an experiment. Remember, I told you experiment. We experimented with. Uh, Celery, you cut the bottom off the stalk with celery when you buy it, it will grow new celery. So I thought, okay, why do I buy celery? Because sometimes I waste celery because I don't use enough of it. And I'll start raising celery just out of a pot in the kitchen. Let me tell you, it took forever for that celery to grow. <laughs> it works, it works, just not on my time frame. What is the name of the gloves? The gloves? Gloves. So, so I just Googled, I searched while she was talking and I Googled and searched claw gloves and got pictures of all of those. And it said Walmart had them, but I couldn't pick them up from the Walmart. So I don't know if they actually sell them in store or if I could order it and pick it up there. Thank you. But you know, when you're weed, well, let me go back. When I'm weeding my flowers, when you start picking at those little tiny weeds after a while, Another time that, that my fingernails start hurting is when I'm getting the dead buds off my roses. I'm anxious to try them on that kind of stuff because, I mean, those ends, whoops, it might help to put them on the right hand. She's funny. Questions? Okay, well. I really, really, you don't know. I hope every single one of you got your name in the chat box. Some of you on phones, I hope I can find out. You know, at the end where I had my uh, slide up with my email on it, I hope you will email me. Cause you, I cannot say enough how appreciative I am of you guys for enduring this with me. Um, it was fun, it was, but I bet it'd be a whole lot more fun if we were doing it in person. Katie did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Julie. I'm here too. I'm her daughter-in-law, her favorite daughter-in-law. <laughs> did you help her with the Zoom? Just a little bit. Yes. So now you can go out and tell them I'm Zooming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye.